I'm going to go ahead and get started out of respect for everyone's time. We're glad you're with us here today, folks. Um, this is probably our 16th virtual field trip. We've been doing this since uh, late March when things started closing down. We decided if we can't get into the parks and be with the park rangers and staff, we'll bring the parks to the people. So that's the purpose of our virtual field trip. Uh, we, I'm Lori Ward, I'm CEO at Washington's National Park Fund. We're a vibrant and lively group of uh, passionate parks people, have a lot of strong supporters. I know a lot of you are with us here today. We're led by a strong and um, active board of directors, 21 board members. We work extremely closely with the three national parks, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic. The park superintendents serve as advisors to our board. We're, they're closely engaged with us and we're grateful for the support and the um, participation that they give to Washington's National Park Fund. Before we begin, I wanna mention some of you may be with us as a result of last night's broadcast on Evening Magazine, King 5 News. It was a, a wonderful opportunity for us to showcase how we are bringing the parks to the people. And, uh, so thank you if you're here as a result and we'll be posting the, the story tomorrow on our website. So with that, I'm going to dive right in. I grew up in Michigan and Michigan Wolverines always meant something very different to me, but um, I always found Wolverines to be a bit scary. I don't know. Marissa tells me, you know, they're not mean. So I'm looking forward to this program today. As we begin, I wanna introduce all of you to Marissa Bluestein. Marissa is a park ranger at North Cascades National Park. She's originally from the desert around the Albuquerque, New Mexico area, but that's really beautiful. I've been there and um, just a whole nother world down there. She worked there in television news production after she graduated from college. She moved to Washington State three years ago and attended grad school at Western Washington University studying environmental education. She's worked for the Park Service for four seasons now and uh, three at North Cascades as a park ranger. And she's um, also previously one of the education technicians at Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Marissa. I'm gonna say to everyone watching, Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. We'll address them at the end of the program. And uh, so with that, thank you for joining us again. And Marissa, welcome. We're glad you're with us. Hi, thank you, Lori and Sharon, for having me here today. Um, this is gonna be a great experience and I hope that we all can learn about Wolverines and North Cascades National Park. And so Sharon's going to be doing my PowerPoint today. So you'll hear me saying next on each slide um, as we progress forward. So thank you all for joining me. If you all haven't been to the North Cascades National Park, um, here's kind of a picture of what it could look like. Um, there's a lot of rugged remote mountain ranges with snow most of the year. Um, today the weather was it was kind of cool. It was in the 50s in the morning and it's been warming up and we can actually see the sun today, which is great. So summer seems to be like, it's a little late coming this year, but hopefully the rain will dissipate as it's our dry season and we'll be able to get up into the mountains. And this is kind of a scene you might see up in the high elevations. There's going to be snow most of the year. Um, it is melting out, but you're going to run into snow most of the time here in the North Cascades. And so I'd like to start out with asking a question to you all who are watching um, a poll and it's, have you ever visited the North Cascades National Park? Um, yes or no? And I'll give you a couple seconds to put your answers on there. So we can see the results of the poll. Awesome, so 64% of you have visited the national park, 36% haven't. I hope this will be a good introduction to you virtually visiting and maybe one day you can get to the park. And so if you wanna to advance to the next slide, thanks Sharon. Um, one of the really cool things that I like about North Cascades National Park is its biodiversity, meaning 
its biodiversity in both flora and fauna, plants and animals. And today we have about 75 species of mammals that inhabit the North Cascades, and one of which we're going to be talking about today, which is the wolverine, or gulo gulo, which means glutton glutton. And so when I say the word wolverine, think in your mind, what's the first thing that comes up in your mind? What is maybe like an image or a thought you might have when you hear that word wolverine? And it could be a lot of different things. There's no right or wrong answer. And I'll give you one second. So wolverine, what is that? What do you think of? What first comes into your mind? Um, for some of you, um, Sharon, you can advance the next slide. This might come to your mind. Um, this is Hugh Jackman, and to any of you who thought maybe this program was going to be about Hugh Jackman and the Marvel super or comic book uh, superhero Wolverine, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We'll have to save that for another day. But this is really common. A lot of people think, oh, this, this is what a Wolverine is. It's um, a movie, and it's a person playing um, a comic book superhero. Um, for, some of, for some other of you, you might be thinking of our next slide. This is actually a Wolverine. So congratulations. If this is what you had in your mind, um, this is a Wolverine. They are the largest land-dwelling member of the Muscolid or weasel family. So they are related to other weasels like fishers or martens or badgers, things like that. And so the sea otter is actually the largest muscolid, but they live in the ocean. So the wolverine gets the title of the largest land-dwelling muscolid. And so next slide. So wolverines prefer habitats that look just like this. Um, this is easy path. This is um, about 45 minutes from New Halen, which is where our visitor center is located. Um, it's high in the Alpine. You're gonna have to hike in to get there. Wolverines need and prefer remote, rugged, snowy landscapes like the North Cascades and Alpine and subalpine areas. And so because they prefer these kind of environments, it's really hard for researchers to study them. There aren't roads to these places. There's only one road, Highway 20, that goes through the North Cascades National Park. And in the winter, it's closed. And this area will be covered in heavy snow. So it's really hard for researchers to know a lot about wolverines and their behavior, and we're learning more all the time. And with that, what we do know is, um, next slide, we do know that they occupy large home ranges, so they can travel really long distances in the snow. And the reason we might know that is because there was a study in North Cascades National Park um, that spanned many years that has concluded now and what they would do is that they would trap wolverines, like you see here, in these little log cabins, and they would sedate them. They would take some fur, maybe some blood um, for DNA purposes and to have on record, and they would fix them with this little radio collar. And then they would release them into the wild and track their movements over time. And what they saw is that wolverines have these really large activity areas, as you can see on our next slide. So this is some of the data that they um, found for some of our wolverines that they captured here in um, the North Cascades. I believe they captured around 14 and tracked most of their movements over a long period of time. So if you see, we can see there's one wolverine, Special K, that's like the tangerine type uh, color um, on our map here. So Special K in a nine month period had a thousand square miles of activity area meaning like that was the area that he traveled in the most over this period of time, which is a really long distance, especially for an animal in the snow in these rugged conditions. If we look at another um, wolverine, Chewbacca, which is like the dark blue color, over five and a half months, they traveled 731 square miles. And for female wolverines, their territory or their home ranges are a bit smaller. Um, Xena, she traveled 500 square miles. Zena is like a kind of cherry red. She traveled 500 square miles in seven months. And so usually females have this smaller home range than or activity area than males. Males tend to overlap with one or two females. 
um, for hopefully to run into them so they can reproduce and we can have more wolverines. So there is a really cool story about one wolverine who has traveled a really great distance. Um, his name is Buddy. He was a wolverine from Idaho in the Sawtooth uh, Mountain region. And he traveled over 600 miles to Lake Tahoe, which is in California. So it's not that uncommon for wolverines to travel these really long distances. They do tend to stay in like one place like these wolverines and they will travel these distances over periods of time. They're not doing this in like one, one month or something. So um, next slide, please. So how are they doing this? Um, this is a side view of Wolverine, of Wolverine. Um, and they have some really, really cool adaptations that allow them to travel these great distances and do these really amazing things. So as we can see, our Wolverine here, they're kind of like stocky, kind of muscular, not that long of a leg that you would think for an animal that has to travel these great distances. Um, why, why are they traveling these great distances? Um, for food mostly and for mates. So wolverines are considered um, scavengers. Um, they also will hunt small game like squirrels, rabbits, things like that. But mostly they scavenge things that have been buried in the snow and avalanches or have died in the winter. Things like deer, elk, mountain goats, things like that. And they find these things with their incredible senses of smell. And they can dig out um, dead animals deep within the snow. And another really cool thing that wolverines do in terms of food is that they use the snow as like a refrigerator. So as they're traveling these great distances and roaming around these territories, they will use, they'll bury this um, like mountain goat and they'll come back around and they'll be able to dig it up and smell it with those noses and have food. So they have these caches that are um, spread out through their territory so they can come back to as they keep on roaming. So that's pretty ingenious to use the snow like a refrigerator. Um, and so wolverines are also pretty cool. They also have a really another really cool adaptation to eat these frozen animals. So it is within their their skull, and you can see these teeth right here on this wolverine. They look pretty pretty sharp, um, but the cool adaptation is actually in the back of their mouth. So right now you can actually feel with your tongue your your very far back molar, your very last molar. Feel it feel around like that. What does it feel like to you? Is it like sharp? Is it flat? Is it more smooth? Maybe it's worn down. Um, now imagine that last molar is rotated 90 degrees inward in your mouth. And if that was the case, you would have teeth like a wolverine. And so I did bring a wolverine skull so I can show you what these teeth actually look like. So this is actually an adult Wolverine skull right here. So I'll take the bottom jaw off here. And so you can see these teeth right here are rotated 90 degrees inward. And how this helps the Wolverine is that it allows the Wolverine to crush bone and maybe get to that more nutritious bone marrow. And it also allows them to tear frozen meat. So this is a really cool adaptation that Wolverines have that allow them to do these really interesting things. So wolverines have such powerful jaws that they can crush the, the bones of like elk, caribou, things like that, also skulls. And it's really not uncommon for wolverines to actually eat bones and teeth of dead animals. And so we can go back to our next slide. And there is a really cool, another really cool adaptation that wolverines have. And you can see this wolverine, their paws, how big they are compared to the size of a wolverine. And to give you some context on about how big wolverines are, and then you can maybe see what, how they can travel these really far distances and why they're so tough. Um, wolverines generally weigh around 17 to 55 pounds. Um, most wolverines fall under 40 pounds. And for, so for the size of a wolverine, their paws can be as broad as a 120 pound wolf. And the reason they have these big paws is so they can travel on the snow easier. They use these big broad paws to stay on top of the snow like snowshoes, and that allows them to move quicker and not to post hole or sink down into the snow. 
It also allows them to hunt prey. Sometimes they can take down prey that are five times larger than them, much bigger. Maybe they're not going to take down like a full grown moose or anything, but maybe like a cow or maybe something that has been sick or is it traveling well in the snow. So if you think about an elk or a moose, things like an ungulate, their legs are really long and skinny and they have those hooves, which does not make it easy for them to travel in snow. They're going to get more tired. Um, they're going to get more cold. And so a wolverine, if they have the predatory advantage in the snow, they are able to hunt much larger animals than they are. So they're only about the size of a medium-sized dog. So they're less than 40 pounds and they're the size of a medium-sized dog. Um, and so there are, have also been other cases where Wolverines have been known to maybe chase away bigger predators than them, um, maybe like bears. Um, it's very rare and it's not as common as some, um, maybe you have heard other things chasing or grizzly bears, things like that, but they have chased away much bigger predators than them. And it's not the fact that um, they're chasing them away. It's the fact that they're actually attempting to do that. They have the courage of something being like 200 pounds versus 40 to actually try. It doesn't mean they win every time. They do get killed by cougars and wolves, but they have the courage to actually try, which I think is pretty incredible. And so we can also see these paws. We've talked about um, they're, they're broad, but they also, you can see these really sharp, long claws. So wolverines have five toes on each paw with these really long claws that they use as crampons or like little ice axes to climb. They can climb trees, they can climb in snow and ice, and they can actually use them to scale mountains. So a really cool story about a wolverine. Um, there was a study in Glacier National Park about 10 years ago now. They were doing the same kind of study that North Cascades was doing, trapping these wolverines, collaring them, letting them out into the wild, and tracking their movement. And they found that one wolverine that winter had climbed the highest peak in Glacier National Park, which, uh, next slide, is this peak right here, Mount Cleveland. Mount Cleveland is 10,466 feet high. And in the winter, it is covered in snow. And so these researchers track this wolverine, summiting this mountain, and it not only summited this mountain, but the last almost, the last 5,000-ish feet, maybe 4,900 feet, it did it in 90 minutes. So if you think about the hardest hike you've ever been on or hiking in the North Cascades, which is a lot of vertical gain, it takes a human, the fittest of humans, maybe a half day to gain 5,000 feet and then come back down. Probably a whole day is more like it to go up 5,000, come back down. This Wolverine did that in 90 minutes. And so they use those paws to climb this incredibly snowy and icy mountain in the middle of winter. And biologists were really confused and wondered, well, why? Why would this wolverine do that? They didn't think that there was food up there. They didn't think, think that there was a mate at the top of this mountain, um, unlikely, and unlikely that there was a threat from like another predator. Um, so in the end, they decided that the wolverine climbed this mountain maybe just for fun. Maybe why humans climb mountains, for the challenge, maybe for the view. Um, there was also a theory of like, maybe wolverines just see the world as flat. And this was just the fastest and shortest way to get where they were going. Um, so in the next slide, that summer in Glacier National Park, um, mountaineers tried to recreate the same route that the wolverine had taken. So you can see this red dotted line, that is the route the wolverine took in the winter time. So mountaineers went up with their ropes, their gear, all of this equipment to try and recreate this route. And they were unable to do it, even in the summer. So it's pretty an incredible feat that a wolverine got this first descent um, on this route at Mo on Mount, in Mount Cleveland in Glacier National Park. So pretty interesting stuff. So they're using those paws. They're as cramp crampons and ice axes. They're able to travel these really long distances because they have such broad paws. And so if we go to our next slide.
we can see this is a photo of the holly arm. This is in North Cascades. And this would be the perfect habitat for a wolverine, right? We've talked about how they need really rugged, remote, snowy locations. You would think, oh, this is the perfect place for a wolverine to thrive. When I come up here this summer or next summer, I'm going to see one when I'm going hiking. They're going to be walking around everywhere. So this is a question I'd like to pose to you as well, another poll question. Um, how many wolverines do you think are in Washington? So there's about 200 maybe. You think maybe about 100, 50, maybe about 40. I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. All right, so we can see our answer in our poll and we can go to our next slide as well. So 19% of you thought there were about 200 Wolverines in North Cat were in Washington. I wish there were about 200. 31%, which is the highest, about 100. Um, if you were in that 24%, about 40, you are right. There are less than actually 36 here in Washington. You would think with our cool summers, our really harsh winters, that there'd be a lot more. But there are less than 36 here in Washington, and there are less than 300 in the lower 48. And there might be a reason that we're not seeing a lot of wolverine populations here. So. There's a couple. So the Wolverine lost their US, U.S. historical range in the mid, the early to mid 1900s. And a couple of reasons why were trapping. Wolverines, we see these Wolverines right here. They have really thick fur. It's frost resistant. So trappers or hunters would trap them, use that fur to line their parkas and their jackets. And also Wolverines were really smart. They would also take trappers bait out of their trap meant for other carnivores and they would would eat it and so trappers didn't like that so they were also the consequence of poisoning trappers would poison wolverines so to get rid of them and also one more deforestation was also a big one loss of habitat so the wolverine lost their u.s historical range in the early to mid 1900s if we fast forward to today 2020 there's a couple of reasons why we're not seeing as many as maybe you would think. Um, one of the big reasons um, is highways. So highways, human development. Um, we talked about wolverines needing these really large home ranges, really big areas um, of land to roam in. If you put a highway in between those things, it's really hard for that wolverine to link these, these zones that they need to go to. Um, they have to choose whether to cross the highway and possibly get hit by a car or stay on the other side and maybe not get enough food for that winter or not find a mate and so they won't be able to reproduce. Um, <clears throat> another big reason is climate change. So wolverines are really dependent on snowpack and persistent snowpack. And that's because female wolverines will den from February to May to have their kits or their young. So they need pretty, consistent snowpack between that time and they need some deep snowpack up to 10 feet. So if you think about how tall you are, so I'm five feet tall, if we were to get to 10 feet, I would have to stack two of me on top of each other. So if you think about how tall you are for your six feet, think about how much more height you're going to have to add on to make yourself 10 feet tall. And that would be how much snow a wolverine would need to den and raise their, their kits or their young. And they need that snow because snow is a great insulator. It keeps those kits warm. And because kits are born pure white in the beginning, they're not this brown kind of tan color. They're pure white. Um, they also need it for protection from other predators. And so wolverines really rely on that snowpack. And climate change is changing those things. Um, we're not maybe having as much snow stick around into the late spring. And so that's impacting their denning. And another reason, another reason scientists have found recently is human recreation are impacting wolverine populations. Um, Washington is really a popular place to backcountry ski, the snowshoe, um, Highway 20, the one road that goes through the park. It is closed in the wintertime 
and snowmobilers like to go up there to get into the back country. And so this disturbance, this human disturbance is causing some issues with female denning. And scientists are still studying that and working that out. And so these all sound like pretty daunting problems, right? Climate change, human recreation, human development. It, it sounds like some pretty bad news for the Wolverine, but it's not all bad news. Um, so in our next slide, you can see that this is a Wolverine captured right at Washington Pass in 2019. Um, Washington Pass is on Highway 20. It's about an hour away from New Halem, our visitor center, if you've been to the North Cascade. And it is about over 5,000 feet high in elevation. And this photo comes from the Cascade Wolverine Project. They do a lot of wildlife monitoring and they partner with a lot of other organizations that are doing some research about Wolverine. And this particular Wolverine, her name is Stella. Um, they figured out she was a female, that she lives in the Washington Pass area, and they had seen her two summers or two winters in 2019 and 2018. They, I was told they hadn't seen her in 2020. It doesn't mean that she's not around still. Maybe she's roaming these big territories. Maybe she found someplace else to go. So this is great news. There's Wolverines that are still here, um, and there's female Wolverines hopefully reproducing. And then there was some other really great news um, in our next slide. So Wolverines, this is Wolverine kit. Um, in 2018, a female and two kits were seen south of I-90, Interstate 90. So Interstate 90 is a highway that runs east to west in Washington state, and it separates the north and the south, kind of cuts the state in half. So if Wolverines only exist in the North Cascades, 2018, we found, some, we found wolverine dens in the southern portion of the Cascades. And this was the first reproductive den documented in the western South Cascade range. And it was just the third den in the state to be found in over 75 years. So that's a big deal. And we can check out our next slide and see, oh, they're super cute. Um, they're, they're thriving here. They're, there's only been three. <laughs> So it's not like there's a huge population right now, but it's showing that they are moving down south and they are able to find these new territories and find mates within these um, activity areas. And so one more slide, I think there's one more photo of the Wolverines, yeah. And so there is a big reason why we may be seeing these Wolverines south of I-90. Um, and in our next slide, it's because there's a wildlife bridge that was constructed here in Washington. Um, and it's not just for wolverines, it's for deer, it's for bears, um, elk, smaller animals, things that will help them get to where they need to go um, without having to cross a highway. So this is really instrumental in helping these wolverines get claim these new territories. And it's also helpful for other animals. There's also a overpass that um, Washington Department of Transportation is working on as well. So animals will actually be able to cross over the highway as well soon. Um, and so this is just the under crossing that Wolverines maybe have been able to utilize and could utilize in the future. So that's a big deal. Also, our next slide, which is pretty cool, Wolverines were also seen just recently at the beach. Maybe they were tired of the snow, they wanted to see the ocean. Um, we're not really sure, um, but this Wolverine was seen um, near Ledbetter Point State Park, which is in southwestern Washington, right by the ocean. Um, they were seen, it was seen twice and dozens of miles apart. So two locations covered a lot of ground in those, in those few days that it was there. And researchers are still trying to figure out why is that? They need to do more research. And there's groups that are doing that. So in our next slide, there are these groups that are doing important research, conservation work, and education about wolverines. Um, the National Park Service has done studies, as well as the U.S. Forest Service. And then there's some nonprofits here in Washington that do really great work. Um, Conservation Northwest, the Cascade Wolverine Project, they were the ones who put that um, wildlife camera up at Washington Pass and saw Stella. And the Cascade Carnivore Project, they caught the photo of the kit and the Wolverine south of I-90. And so this is really important work that's continuing. 
And what's really neat about these organizations is that you can actually participate in this work. You don't have to have a wildlife biology degree. You just have to have, you just have to care about these animals and you have to have a passion for knowledge. You wanna learn more. Um, there's a way to actually participate in their community science efforts. Um, one is you can report a sighting. So if you are in Washington state, if you're a backcountry enthusiast, you like to go skiing in the winter time, if you think you see wolverine tracks or actually see a physical wolverine, you can contact the Cascade Wolverine Project and fill out um, a sighting report, an observation, and they'll actually look into it. So you're actually contributing to furthering this work. And the Conservation Northwest, they're participating in wildlife monitoring projects. So regular people can actually go and help set up cameras. They can monitor um, what goes by the cameras. It's not all wolverines. Um, you know, they're doing research on a lot of other carnivores in the area. So you actually get to participate in these things and learn as you're doing it. And so in our next slide, this is how researchers actually do this kind of work here in Washington when they don't have those log cabins that you can go out um, like a couple days a week and ski out to and check to see if there's a wolverine um, in there. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of human effort, it's really hard work. So they put up these things called run pole stations and it looks just like what you're seeing. It's this wooden structure that's high above the ground to count for snowfall in the winter. Um, it has this pole that runs across the top and then it has some meat hanging down. And then also you might be able to see some of these little like things poking out um, their little hair snags like brushes. And so they put these here for the winter and then they monitor um, the comeback in the summer and see the photos that they've taken. And what they really wanna see is a wolverine's chest. They wanna take a picture of that. So in our next photo, what they're hoping for is that wolverines will put their paws up on this pole and so they can see their chest because just like humans, have unique and identifying fingerprints to each of us. Wolverines have unique and identifying chest blazes. And so in our next photo, you can see that some of these, that you can tell the difference between a lot of wolverines and that's how they identify them. Um, that's how they can tell if they're male or female. Maybe they've had kits recently or are pregnant. And that's how they can tell um, how many there are. Maybe they've seen this particular wolverine at this run pole station near Washington Pass, or they've seen this one near Easy Pass, so they can kind of get an idea of where they are and what they're doing. And so we can go to our next, I think there's one more. Yeah, so you can kind of see this difference in chest blazes between wolverines, and it's pretty cool that they can identify this. And this is the kind of work that um, these nonprofits are doing. You would get to go through these photos and see these actual like wolverines with these different chest blazes, able to identify them, they name them so they can keep on um, recording their movements and things. And so in our next slide, oh, there's one more chest blaze, I guess there's one more. Great, so this is a picture of, um, from Sahali Glacier Camp, which is, one of the highest camps that you can camp at in North Cascades. And like we talked about, this is perfect habitat for a wolverine. It's remote, it's rugged, um, there's snow. And so we're talking about these challenges the wolverine's facing, climate change, um, highways, loss of habitat. And so to kind of get some context or maybe how you can identify what a wolverine might be going through or maybe how you would feel, so imagine we're all sitting in our homes right now. Um, imagine your home kept getting smaller and it wasn't your own choice. I know a lot of people I'd give a program to, they're like, well, I'm in an RV. And, but it's not your choice. This is actually just happening. So your home is getting smaller. Maybe your refrigerator is starting to shrink. Um, maybe grocery stores become farther and farther away and you have to travel farther for food and you can't get as much food because your refrigerator won't hold as much. So you don't want your food to go bad. Um, imagine how you would feel if that kept happening, if you kept your walls kept closing in. And 
I know we're in the age of quarantine right now, so probably a lot of you feel that way. But imagine it's happening, and what you what what would you do? How would you feel about that? That's kind of maybe what the Wolverine is going through right now um, with this snow or their their reliance on snowpack and it being unreliable right now. And so they're facing a lot of challenges, and like the biggest one would be climate change that we've talked about. And climate change is a huge problem, and it's not an easy one to fix. It's not going to take just one person. It can take a lot of people doing a lot of different things because there's not just one right answer. And it's, climate change isn't just affecting wolverines. It's affecting people. It's affecting plants, animals, um, the ocean. And so there's a lot of different things that we can do. And maybe we won't ever see a wolverine in our lifetime, or maybe some of us might not get to the North Cascades. But just because you're not going to see one doesn't mean they don't exist and doesn't mean that we can't care about them. So I would encourage all of you to maybe explore your own backyard safely as you can as possible and observe what's around your own environment because wherever you're from, even if it's, um, you know, a desert environment, maybe a coastal environment or someplace that is really cold all the time. We all have our personal wolverines that are affecting our community, something that is being threatened by climate change. Um, and so I would encourage you to look at those things. And because we can't care about something if we don't know about it. So things that are being affected in your home community, maybe by like pollution, air pollution, water pollution, things like that. We all have those things. We just have to seek them out. And so as I mentioned, if you are in Washington, you can help the Wolverine um, by volunteering with those um, nonprofits or donating time, things like that, or um, filling out an observation. And if you are in Washington and you want to learn more about Wolverines, there's a great book called The Wolverine Way. It's by Douglas Chadwick, and he was part of that study in Glacier National Park. He was a volunteer. And he writes a really good book kind of mixing environmental journalism with scientific data. So you get to know all these really cool facts, but in a really engaging way. So it's not like reading an academic paper or anything. And I usually like to end my program with a quote from that book because I really feel like it sums up the Wolverine's attitude. And so I'm going to close this little thing because I can't see. All right. It goes, if Wolverines have a strategy, it's this. Go hard and high and never back down. I can't read that part. Not even from the biggest grizzly and least of all from a mountain. Climb everything, eat everybody. Dead, long dead, moose, mouse, fox, frog. It's no warm heart or frozen bone. And so that's a quote from the Wolverine Way. I think it exemplifies the Wolverine's attitude. And so I like to thank all of you for joining me in this virtual field trip. I hope that. Um, this was a good introduction into wolverines, what they do, how they are, and into the North Cascades. And so thank you all. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. I mean, you had me every step of the way. Seriously, that was really great, Marissa. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. You're mm -hmm. welcome. And we have some great questions. And I think you like wolverines because you're courageous. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I do. I really believe that. Okay, so we really have some good questions. Do you know if there are any wolverines in Europe? And we're going to fly through these because the number of folks have questions. Do you know if there's okay. any in Europe? Yeah, there are. So there's some in like Norway, Russia, or well, Finland, um, like really cold countries like that. There are wolverines in Europe. Yeah. Um, the predator of a wolverine, I think you mentioned wolves. Yeah, wolves comment? are their major predator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where do they like to settle to give birth? So they like to den. So they'll pick like um, something like a tree or a rock um, like structure and then they'll burrow down in the snow and go in there like a natural kind of cave. So they need that snow above it. And then yeah, they'll find something that's like anchored and then they'll, they'll dig a den if, if that answers the question. See, um, what do you do if you come across one on the trail? I hear they can be, they can get pretty riled up. <laughs> um, 
Well, it is highly, highly unlikely that you will ever come across one on the trail. Um, as far as I know, what I've read is that they don't interact with humans. Um, it's not, you're not going to, they're not going to try and attack you or anything. They're going to just run on by. They're usually running. Every time I've seen a video of Wolverine, they're running. So it's unlikely that you're going to see one. And if you do, they will run away faster than you will. Uh, we'd like to know more. They, folks, if you're interested in learning more about Cascade Wolverine Project, go ahead and Google that. And what is the, um, or Bing it, what is the Wolverine lifespan? Oh, great question. Um, so I've read a bunch of different things. So the average life expectancy is around eight to 10 years, but it's usually around four to six because they live in such harsh environments and get killed by other predators or by other wolverines. So it's, I've read eight to 10, but it's usually a little less than that. I'm pretty excited. I live out in, on Snoqualmie Pass and I live not far from the, um, the overpass. I encourage our viewers to Google that, I-90 overpass wildlife, and you'll see the photos of that, that bridge. It's been fun to watch it take shape and, and be built. And I love hearing that it's having that positive impact. I knew it, but to hear about it in relation to the Wolverine, that's pretty cool. Uh, does mm -hmm. the color of a Wolverine help it? Does it help the fact that they're so brown? And if so, how? Does it help that they're so brown? Yeah, does the color, how, yeah. You I'm not sure. I mean, I probably would be more helpful if they were white. Yeah, in the um, winter. Since they, since they live in the snow, but I don't, I think they're the color for just, that's just the color that they are. They have those white patches or those tan patches that help them. Um, but I think, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if it helps them or not. Mm -hmm. The pictures of the claws, that was fascinating. I've never seen anything like that. And the story about Glacier National Park, that Wolverine climbing, that is a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, sure. What is, what is it that motivates and inspires you to study wolverines, Marissa? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so when I was in grad school, um, I didn't get to go, but there was a hike down to like go and maintain one of those run pole stations. And I heard all about it from um, my fellow cohort members. And ever since then, I was really fascinated in what wolverines like why they have this characteristic of like wilderness and wildness and what that means. And I really wanted to invest some time into figuring out how this creature that was so small and so courageous could do these incredible things. And I feel like maybe it's a reflection on how I want to live my life and how I want to be portrayed in my own personal endeavors. And so I think that was probably a lot, had a lot to do with it. Really great. It was fun to hear about how, how they will stand up to animals bigger than them, even though they may not be able to take them down. That's a sign of how courageous they are. Um, how many wolverines are in Washington State? Could you repeat that, please, roughly? Sure. Yeah. Um, there's less than 36 in Washington State and less than 300 in the lower 48. And once again, please repeat the lifespan. Someone didn't catch oh, that? Oh, sure. Sure, no problem. Um, it's eight to 10 years, but actually they've, it's usually four to six, depending on kind of where they live. Montana life expectancy range is like four to six years. Average might be eight to 10. That would be a really old Wolverine. Thank you. I think we've gotten through our questions. Um, I want to mention to folks as we begin to wrap up, first off, thank you, Marissa. Really, that was terrific. Uh, mm -hmm. I love your passion. I want to mention to people that it was announced this morning that the Department of Interior has terminated the possibility of the reintroduction of grizzly bears in the North Cascades. It's been a long time study. A lot of work has gone into it and that decision was made and announced by the Department of Interior this morning. So I want to share that. Um, and I want to share, people often ask, this photo right here is Mount Shuxon. It is in the North Cascades National Park. You can see this very view from um, our, near Artist Point, south of Artist Point, um, up at Mount Baker, and beautiful, beautiful mountain. I think that's everything. Marissa, anything else you want to say before we sign off? Uh, no, just thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity to share uh, things about Wolverines and the North Cascades. You're welcome. 
Okay, everyone, have a good even, afternoon, evening. Here's what we've been funding over the last few years and the areas that we focus in on, 650,000 over the last year was awarded. Save the date, Monday, the first week in August, Monday, August 3rd, we'll be kicking off our live auction, virtual auction online, and it will run through Friday evening. Lots of great things, so, so be uh, mark that on your calendar. And then finally, um, to learn more about Washington's National Park Fund or to show your support, go to WNPF.org. We are going to, in every other week format, and um, two weeks from today, Sharon, I don't remember what it is, chime in. Oops. Wildflowers. Thank you. Wildflowers and metal <laughs> restoration at Mount Rainier. Thank you, Sharon. Marissa, have a good afternoon. Everyone, thanks for joining us. Take good care. Thanks. Yep.